Hey everybody, it's Ripley. Today we're going to talk about angles on the coordinate plane. I'm going to give you some terminology, excuse me, and I'm going to um, give you a formula or two to play with for your homework when you come to class. Okay? All right, let's talk about angles. In the geometric context, in your mathematical travels down the road, or excuse me, in the past, I'm sure that you've seen this referred to as angle A, and, excuse me, and angle B, and here's angle C, and then remember how this was angle A, and angle B, and angle C. Well, in the coordinate plane, in functional parlance, we're not going to refer to these as capital letters anymore. What we're going to refer to them as, as lower, cake, lower case, excuse me, Greek letters. So we're going to have theta, we're going to have alpha, we're going to have beta, and sometimes, from time to time, a gamma will show up. All right, but think of theta as being the currency of, of coordinate trigonometry. So it's kind of like the X in algebra. We get to use all the letters, but X we go to, it's kind of our go-to variable. Okay, now, first thing we need is we need sort of a standard way to talk about angles in the coordinate plane. So we're going to talk about angles first in standard position. All right, an angle in standard position is, it just gives us kind of a home base to work from. So the way an angle in standard position works is draw yourself a Cartesian plane. Here's an X. Here's a Y. I'm going to change my colors. An angle in standard position works this way. The vertex is always located at the origin. Remember, the vertex is just the point from whence the rays uh, go out to make the angle. All right? And then the f one of the first rays, excuse me, one of the rays, has to reside on the positive side of the x-axis. And this side that rests on the positive side of the x-axis is called the initial side. All right. Okay, now, the way that we're going to build our angle is it's going to open up like a Japanese hand fan. So if you can visualize that, we, we just spread this thing open. We rotate it open. And what we get is we'll get an angle that looks kind of something like that. Now, this counterclockwise direction, this counterclockwise rotation was not by accident. The angle that we made is actually the measure of this opening process. It's how big that was, right? If we go counterclockwise, this is, again, this is just standard notation. It's something that's been agreed upon by everybody. Then theta is greater than zero, all right? Now, if I take that same approach and I got my initial side over here remember my vertex is always at the origin but instead I choose to open this angle up in the clockwise direction so we get this guy right here let's say then theta is going to be less than zero all right again we have our initial side on the x-axis we've got our terminal side sorry got to define that. This is the terminal side of the angle. It's where the, the swooping motion terminates. So this is my initial and this is my terminal. Okay? So again, that may feel arbitrary, but it's kind of like on the real number line. It may feel arbitrary that if I go to the left of zero, that's negative, and I go to the right, it's positive, but that's just become the natural way in which we refer to the real numbers. It's exactly the same thing when we refer to angles and how they're built in standard position. All right? All right. Now let's go ahead and talk about what this... I'm going to go ahead and block this off so we can work around it. What is this angle thing? Now, in our brains and in our geometry, uh, geometry, we have referred to in the past as them having a degree measure, like uh, 15 degrees equals angle A, right? And we can see, I mean, that's going to be a kind of a weird little, little 15 degree angle, right? The problem is, is that we are taking these angles and we're putting them on the real, on the coordinate plane. And the coordinate plane is built by two real number lines, the x-axis and the y-axis. Remember, real numbers don't have any units. They have no units at all. So what we need is a way to refer to these angles but without having any units at all. Now degrees have this guy. And that degree, that sign, is along for the ride when we start trying to do mathematics with it. So I need a way to define this 
swooshing motion in terms of a real number value. And I also need a way to convert everything away from this. Now, what we're going to need is we're going to, I just told you that angle measures in the real, in, excuse me, in the coordinate plane have no units. But I'm going to make one up just so I don't say one unit all the time. I'm going to say one radian. One radian. Now, really, this radian is a not unit. It has no units to it. So if you were to write one, that would imply one radian. Okay, now let's figure out what a radian is. I'm going to use some fancy terminology on this, but don't be afraid. Again, I apologize for my artwork in advance. A radian is defined as follows. If I have a circle of radius 1, the radian, one radian, what's going on here? One radian is defined as the angle measure such that if this is, if this radius is 1 and this angle measure right in here is theta equals, whoa, equals 1, excuse me, then this arc length right here also equals 1. Arc length equals 1 as well. Remember the arc length is just the length of what's referred to as the subtended portion of the circle. Subtended portion just means the part where the angle slams into the circle. Okay, That's one radian measure long and you may say okay well what's that look like if I have a circle that's got a radius bigger than one. Well, it's exactly the same thing. That's the coolest part. Let's say now that my radius is three. And I got my angle and I've got my subtended portion of the circle referred to the arc length. And I have theta equals one radian. All right? If theta equals one, and this radius is 3, then this arc length, I'm tired of writing arc length, and as we all know, mathematicians are lazy, so I'm going to give it a new notation, S. Then S is also 3. Regardless of the size of the circle, the radius of the circle, if I were to take another circle, now this is where it gets fun, especially with my drawing. I wish I were more of an artist. If I take this same angle, and stretch it out, and stretch it out like this. Th notice theta is still one. All right, whatever this radius is right here, I need to change colors. Whatever this radius is right here, let's do orange. If this radius is say r equals five, then you guessed it. The length of that arc length s is 5. Now that's something else, isn't it? No matter the size, if I make a little teeny tiny little tiny thing in here, again, theta is still the same. There's my little angle right there. There's my little angle right there. And let's say, let's change colors again. Let's say, excuse me, let's say that with lavender, if r, if r equals 0.5, then s equals 0.5. Guess what? We have just defined the one unit in angle measures that is in complete absence of any sort of unit measure. See? Or excuse me, in any, any sort of units. We no longer have this degree. This one radian is to theta what one unit is to the real number line. They are exactly the same. Now, we're going to get into this shortly, um, and, I'll, and we'll be able to apply this really, really nicely. And this is going to build all of our trigonometric understanding around this idea of building an angle that has no units attached to it like degrees. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pause here and let you guys absorb this for a little bit. You might want to go back and, and rerun it in parts to see, to try and build some understanding. And we'll move on to arc length and converting from degrees to radians and radians to degrees here in just a moment.